Today, we're on the outskirts of St. Vincent's campus in an area whose history dates all the way back to the mid to late 18th century. In fact, we're joined here with hundreds of the Benedictine community and thousands from the lay community who have come and gone before us. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, where are we? Well, we're here at the St. Vincent Cemetery, and we have a great program lined up for you today, so stick around. The origins of this St. Vincent Cemetery date all the way back to the year 1860, but it wasn't the first cemetery here. The original community of St. Vincent was originally known as Sportsman's Hall Parish when it was founded in 1790 by Father Theodore Browers. This original parish eventually formed a small burial ground around its church in order to bury their dead. It wasn't until the year 1846 when a Benedictine monk named Boniface Wimmer took charge of all the land and founded St. Vincent. But it would be another 14 years until the deceased from the original burial ground were actually moved up here to the cemetery as we know it today. At that point, this began the separation of the Benedictine community and the lay community. In today's episode of Where Are We, we're actually going to learn a little bit about the history of St. Vincent Cemetery and, and how it developed over the years. All of the research that's going to be presented to you today was actually done by one of St. Vincent College's history majors who actually enjoys a work-study position here at the cemetery. Now, later on in the program, we're going to meet him and his crew, but for now, we'd like you to enjoy this unique perspective of the St. Vincent Cemetery. After the church graveyard was moved to its present location, a division began to occur in how the new cemetery was laid out. When the graves were moved, those who were members of the Benedictine community founded by Boniface Wimmer were laid separately from those of the parish congregation. Long rows began to be formed where the monks would be buried together, rather than side by side with the members of the parish congregation. The distance between the graves of those of the religious order and those of the parish members is not a great one, only a few feet in some places. Nonetheless, a separation can still be seen in the layout of the cemetery. This separation seems to show that there is a distinction between the two groups who make up the St. Vincent community, the religious and the lay. The distinction seems to arise out of the belief that the Benedictines are a separate community within the larger community of St. Vincent. Because of this idea of division, the monks chose to separate themselves from the rest of the community in death, just as they had while they were living together in the monastery separate from the outside congregation. This practice of religious and lay separation continued until 1869, when Theodore Brower's remains were also moved to the new cemetery so that his body would be placed with the rest of his congregation that he founded almost 80 years earlier. It was moved to its present location out of respect for his initial founding of St. Vincent, and so he could again become a part of the community he had started so many years ago. This reverence for his founding of the St. Vincent community can be seen by the epitaph placed over his grave. It reads, Beneath this cross lies the body of Rev. Theodore Browers, OFM founder and first pastor of the Sportsman Hall Parish, later named St. Vincent, from November 1789 to October 1790. Born in Rotterdam, Holland in 1738, ordained a priest on June 5, 1762, died on October 29, 1790. This placement of Brower's grave side by side with those of the congregation which he served was used as an example and followed by Boniface Wimmer himself after his death on December 8, 1887. Wimmer was placed in a grave beside Browers, and the two were memorialized with a huge stone cross marking their graves. This began the tradition of burying the abbots of St. Vincent together with their congregation, symbolizing that they were still connected with those who they served. Although this was somewhat of a connection between the lay people of the community and the religious monks, only the abbots of St. Vincent have been buried with the lay people of the community, thus still incorporating somewhat of a divide between the monastic burial area and the rest of the cemetery dedicated to the lay members of the community. Both the religious and the lay sections together have continued to grow and change over the years since the first graves were moved to the cemetery. St. Vincent Cemetery is unique in that it holds the distinction of being one of the oldest Catholic instituted cemeteries 
west of the Appalachian Mountains. Although the cemetery began well over 200 years ago, it continues to grow and develop so it can uphold the tradition of being a place in which the people of the St. Vincent community can bury their dead. After the movement of the church graveyard to the present day cemetery, more and more people began to have their family members buried in the cemetery. Because of the influx of burials, the cemetery began to expand outward toward the north of its present location at the time. What is now called Section St. Boniface and Section St. Anthony are considered the original locations for the burials moved to the cemetery and the sections in which all new burials would be placed up until 1901 when Section St. Catherine was created in an effort to expand the cemetery. Section St. Anthony also contains the area of Potter's Field. These sections were designed to emulate the trend in modern cemetery design. The graves and headstones were placed in rows so that it would be easy to walk through the cemetery. Also paths running up and down the sections were common. Although these paths were common upon the creation of the cemetery, they have since become roads or converted into graves erasing the cemetery's stylistic atmosphere that had once been incorporated into its design. This type of cemetery landscape was thriving during the St. Vincent Cemetery development and soon the cemetery began to rapidly expand. One tradition that was upheld when laying out the cemetery in its first years was to have the bodies lay facing an easterly direction. This was done so that on the day of judgment when Christ would return to the earth, the bodies of the dead would be able to greet Christ with the rising sun. This tradition was upheld and continued to be an important aspect in the cemetery up until the 1960s when new sections were added to the cemetery and this tradition was no longer practiced. This cemetery growth also included other Catholics who chose to be buried in the St. Vincent Cemetery even though they may have been members of other parishes in the surrounding area. After the section of St. Catherine was created in 1901, records show that it was not frequently used until around the years of 1910 and 1911 when more than just a few burials occurred every couple of years. Burials continued exclusively in the sections of St. Anthony, St. Boniface, and St. Catherine up until the year 1934 when a new section was opened for the use of burials. This new section was created on the northern side of the existing cemetery and given the name of section St. David Annex. This section of St. David Annex would eventually become too small for the amount of people wanting to secure themselves and their family members a place to be buried. The frequency of the use of the cemetery and the rate at which it was expanding at this time shows the growth that the community had achieved over the past 150 years. The cemetery growth is impressive considering just about 40 years earlier the cemetery was limited to the two sections of St. Anthony and St. Boniface and now at the beginning of the 1940s six sections were in existence and all were continually used for the burials of St. Vincent's dead. The cemetery continued to operate at this size consistently up until the end of 1965 when five new sections were added, doubling the size of the cemetery. These new sections were incorporated on the western side of the existing cemetery in a simple grid-like pattern, also known as Lawn Memorial Parks. In the year 1993, the latest sections were added to the cemetery, continuing in the style of the Lawn Memorial Park, the Memorial Garden of St. Benedict, and the Memorial Garden of St. Scholastica I and II. These new sections represent the modern institutions of burial for the community of St. Vincent. These sections are composed of buried vaults in which the dead are buried on top of one another. This was done because of a concern that adding too many sections of the customary burials to the cemetery would exhaust the land's ability to expand for the future. At the time of burial, the dirt is dug away and the lid of the vault is removed to place the casket inside. For those vaults in St. Benedict, a divider is placed in between the two caskets so one can be placed on top of the other in a double deep vault. This system acts as an underground mausoleum where twice the amount of burials can be put in one area. These lawn memorial parks consist of flat, flush to the ground grave markers laid out in simple grid-like patterns allowing ease of access for those wishing to visit a grave. The concept of these lawn memorial parks is to replace the old, destructive, prone grave markers with attractive, easy to maintain flat grave markers where visitors can easily access the graves in the sections. 
Not only do these new lawn memorial park sections allow easy access for the visitors to the cemetery, but they also allow for easy upkeep. Because these sections have no upright grave markers, a riding mower can easily mow the section with little effort. The interpretation of how a cemetery should look according to standards of the time was carried into the personal choices of each family for their monuments to the dead in their own families. An example of this type of gravestone artwork reflecting the common churchyard design of the late 18th century and early 19th century can be seen in the cemetery on a few gravestones. The most common image of this time period is called Death's Head or Soul Effigy. This image is represented in the St. Vincent Cemetery by a human face with wings. This soul effigy represents the later thought of the death's head design by incorporating the notion that the body may be buried in the ground beneath this gravestone, but the soul is something separate and incorruptible. Other images that were popular in the late 18th and early 19th centuries that represent the attitude that the lay community had toward death can be found in the symbol of the weeping willow tree and that of the urn. The symbol of the weeping willow tree represents immortality through the idea that the tree is indestructible just as the soul is after death. The symbol of the urn is mainly used for decorative purposes, but in the context of this time period it offered a less grim image to represent death rather than a skull or a soul effigy. Another prominent symbol that can be found throughout the cemetery is that of the ivy vine. Ivy can be seen developing prominently in the funerary design around the 1870s in the St. Vincent Cemetery and continuing up through modern times. This symbol was used to show attachment for the lost loved one because ivy is known for attaching to things so that it can climb. Another use for the image of ivy was to show that the soul is eternal, just as the ivy leaf stays eternally green. The ivy can also have Catholic symbolism when comparing the Trinity to the three points on the ivy leaf. Because of all these attributes, the ivy symbol became popular for many people in the cemetery through the years. The most widely used symbol over the course of the institution of St. Vincent Burial is the cross. The symbol of the cross, which can take on various forms, is at the heart of the Catholic Church. This cherished symbol can be found in every section of the cemetery, old and new. Because of the endurance of this symbol, it can only show that the lay community has continued to be one that respects the beliefs of the old and carries these traditions onward down through the generations. Although the cross has never given way in its popularity, many other symbols have grown in importance over the centuries to the community of St. Vincent. One such symbol bearing religious importance to the community members is the inscription of the letters IHS. This symbol is an abbreviation for Christ's name in Greek and is usually used in conjunction with the cross. Around the time of the 1880s, a large Eastern European population had settled in Pennsylvania and other Mid-Atlantic and New England states. One example of a new tradition brought in from these immigrants includes the popularization of the photograph on grave markers. Throughout St. Vincent Cemetery, hundreds of photographs can be found in every section, but a large number of these photographs can be found in the era of the Italian immigrants. Although immigration was a prominent factor in influencing styles of funerary art, natural occurrences can also play a role in the emergence of new types of funerary art and the way in which they are used to represent the community whom erected them. An example of this natural phenomenon, influencing grave marker design, was the flu epidemic of the years 1918 and 1919. An estimated 228 people were buried in the cemetery between the months of June 1918 and May 1919, causing a new funerary development to take place. Due to the massive amount of deaths in the community, grave markers could not be fashioned in the slow and artistic process that they had once been. Instead, grave markers were in a sense mass produced in order to fulfill the need of placing a grave marker on each new grave. Because of this mass production of grave markers, most of the varying styles of markers went by the wayside for a more uniformed, easily produced model. Also, because of the great amount of burials occurring over a short period of time, it was practiced to group many of the dead affected by the flu together in similar areas in the cemetery so that the process of digging graves would not be halted by the movement of tools and loss of manpower. 
There is also a lot to be learned when studying the symbols that are found on the graves of the monastic community. The iron crosses in the religious section predominantly show the strength of the religious community as a whole, but more subtle crosses can be found on some of the individual monk graves, particularly on the older gravestones in the monk section. An example of this can be seen on a few of the gravestones where a floriated cross was carved. These floriated crosses, with their three projections on the tips, symbolize the Trinity. Although crosses were popular, they were not the only carvings used on these gravestones. One of the more popular symbols used on the gravestones and even on the iron crosses themselves is the RIP symbol. This symbol is the abbreviation of a Latin verse when translated means rest in peace, which was at one time a popular verse to have inscribed on one's grave marker in both religious and lay parts of the cemetery. This verse, although short, describes the religious community's interpretation of death. This interpretation follows the tradition of wishing that the deceased have a happy and peaceful afterlife, something that was sought out by everyone in the community. Another symbol that finds its way onto the gravestones of a few monks is the image of the heart. One of these heart images appear to have been pierced by a sword symbolizing repentance. The other heart, topped by a cross, seems to bear the notion that this heart was used in the service of Christ. Both of these symbols appear side by side so as to tell the story of repentance and the service to God that followed. Although these symbols are unique to a few gravestones, nothing is more interesting and more mysterious than the star symbols found on a few gravestones in the monk section. These stars may represent the notion of divine guidance, or they may simply be used for decoration. The community of St. Vincent has left behind its legacy of change and progression through one of its most treasured pieces of history, its cemetery. The ideas and attitudes of the community members towards death have inspired many changes to the cemetery over the time it has been in existence. Through these changes of ethnic, religious, and outside origins, it is possible to see the many broad and small changes that have affected the community as a whole. From the separation of the religious and lay sections in the cemetery to the effect of the immigration period and the flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919, the physical changes that can be seen in the cemetery can tell the story of the community whom it represents. Well, welcome back to the program. I hope you enjoyed the uh, historical perspective of the St. Vincent Cemetery. I'm actually joined here now with a companion of mine, Alex Short, who actually did the research for all the uh, information that you just witnessed. Uh, Alex, take us through why did you put this research together, what was the reason behind it, and uh, what was the experience like? Well, to start with, I needed to come up with a thesis for my historical project, for my thesis for a history degree, and so, I turned to what I had a lot of experience in was the cemetery, which I had been working in for several years. And so, following that, I, uh, I don't know, it just uh, came to me one day, and uh, here I am. Cool, cool. So you said you've been working here for uh, a couple years, I, I assume as a work study, right? That's correct. Okay, yes. so, you know, of all the uh, positions you could have had, you know, down on campus, all sorts of work study positions that there are. Uh, what made you continue once you started up here to, to stay in the cemetery for all these years? Well, one of the things was the historical aspect of the cemetery. I really enjoyed working up here. Uh, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Just every day was something different. Oh, I bet. So, it just I was always drawn to this type of work outside. Very nice and uh, works out good for me. Well, take me through a, a typical day. What is a typical work day for you uh, in the cemetery? What kind of things go on? Well, it starts out, we get in, we usually get our work list for the day, find out what we're doing, mm -hmm. then we head out. Usually it's nothing more than trimming a few sections, and uh, that usually takes up most of our time. But uh, every once in a while, we'll get the occasional funeral where we'll end up 
digging the grave in the morning, preparing it for the funeral, and then uh, completing it towards the end of the day. I, I noticed that uh, there's a section where the vault's already in the ground. Yes, what what the, all is involved in, in preparing a funeral for one of those one of those sections? Well, the long crypts, as they're called, is uh, really our expertise area. We're completely in charge of those. No outside help comes in. We unearth the vault lids by hand, and we also uh, prepare the tent area mm -hmm. with the lowering device and everything. And it works out pretty good. It's just a lot of work, though. Well, I appreciate the time, Alex. And I, uh, again, as a reminder, the, all the information that you saw earlier on was actually from Alex's research paper that, that he did, as he said. So uh, we appreciate you allowing us the opportunity to, to bring your paper to, you know, to life, to actually see it uh, visually. And uh, we're going to check in on another one of your crew members. But uh, thanks for the yeah. time, and uh, I'll let you get back to work. All thanks right? a lot. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Alex. All right, we're going to uh, take a short break, but when we come back, we're actually going to visit with one of Alex's other crewmates, uh, Paul Boland. Maybe you guys know him on campus, but so we'll be right back with Paul, and we'll see what he has to say about the cemetery. Welcome back to Where Are We? Uh, right before we took a break, I told you that uh, we'd come back and talk to one of the other St. Vincent crew members here who is also a, a work study. Uh, his name is Paul Boland. Paul, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Paul Boland and uh, I'm a, going into my senior year. Um, I'm an accounting music major from New Jersey and uh, became aware of this job about right after my freshman year. Uh, my prefect from St. Benedict Hall got me in contact with the, uh, the uh, boss of the cemetery and so uh, he hired me and so now I'm here. Do you remember your first day? Do you, what was your first day like when you first came up here to the cemetery? What was that like and you knew you, this was where you had signed up to work? <laughs> well, it was a little weird. Um, I met everybody and uh, we basically got started with uh, trimming this section right here and um, a few other people showed up later on that day around lunchtime I think it was and uh, they helped out it took a few hours to trim the section cool so um, so you've been up here now for a couple years uh, what would you say is your your favorite part about working up here is some of the things that you do day to day what, are, what is your favorite part about working up here is it cutting the grass is it uh, preparing uh, a grave for a funeral what do you like the most uh, probably um, doing the digging in St. Benedict, um, getting ready for a grave there. I don't like setting up the tent down there though, so I guess you take the good with the bad. <laughs> what, um, what would you say is a, uh, a typical response? I know when uh, uh, sometimes I tell people that we have a cemetery here and that it's a work study position, they, they kind of get shocked. I mean, what, what kind of response do you get when you tell people that your work study job is that you work in a cemetery? Well, their eyes kind of get wide and then they, they're like, well, do you actually bury people? I'm always like, yeah, <laughs> and so, I don't know, it's a funny reaction. It's probably the best summer job you can have or best work study job you can have that gets the most conversation topics out of it anyway. So you get to work, you work uh, during the summer too as well? Yeah. That's cool. So uh, is that your favorite time? I know, well, what happens in the winter? I mean, if you work during the summer, do you also work in the winter when it's all snowy? Do you yeah. still cut grass? Is there, are there things to do? No, there's plenty of things to do. Uh, well, there's all the graves that we have to do. We have like about 82 on average per year. Wow. And this week we've just done uh, three. And actually this summer is a little different because uh, for some reason we keep having like Saturday burials. So it's almost like six day weeks every week. Well, uh, I'm glad that there's someone of your stature up here. A nice student from the St. Vincent uh, College up here working real hard and uh, making sure that the long history uh, that is the St. Vincent Cemetery continues to be a thriving one and uh, an opportunity for people like yourself to have a, a nice work study but uh, at a good place. So Paul, I thank, thank you for your time. Well, thanks a lot, Fred. And uh, I'll let you get back to work with Alex. Tell him uh, I said thanks and uh, that'll, be, that'll pretty much be it. Uh, folks, thanks for tuning into our show this week, Where Are We? Episode 1 of St. Vincent Cemetery. Uh, again, thanks to Paul and everybody else that was kind enough to let us get some footage and uh, help us out with this. So. See you next week.